Hello, and welcome to another Atlantic Council Geotech Hour. I'm your host, Dr. David Bray, director of the Geotech Center, where we're discussing how data and technology are changing geopolitics, how we operate as societies, and how we move forward as a planet, striving to solve the challenges of COVID-19. We have a very exciting panel here today, and we're gonna try a first. Not only are we gonna have a very lively conversation with the panelists, they're also gonna share some insights from the field in terms of what they're seeing, as we make sense of strategies in terms of advancing technologies for tests, for treatments, and COVID-19 vaccine strategies, which clearly we're gonna need, ideally in the near future ahead. I'd like to turn first to Dr. Daniel Kraft, good friend for more than a decade, I think, I feel like now. Uh, first time on the Geotech Hour. Daniel, real quick, could you introduce yourself and what gives you hope in terms of data and tech advances to help with the COVID-19 recovery? Thanks, David. Uh, great to be here. Um, so I'm Daniel Kraft. I'm a traditionally trained physician scientist, uh, run a program called Exponential Medicine and, and chair uh, medicine for Singularity University. And what I think is giving me some hope in this era is the silver lining of COVID is all the amazing virtual and in-person collaborations and creativity that are coming to address the whole paradigm uh, continuum from prevention, diagnostics, and therapy. Um, I have a role chairing the X Prize Pandemic Alliance Task Force made up of hundred different organizations. And there's just uh, a lot of, um, I think, uh, connections and, and cross fertilizations that will help us move forward with the data layer, uh, as well as testing, as well as therapeutics, all the way to how we address the, the infodemic that we're living in as well. Excellent. And real quick, Daniel, if I could ask a quick rejoinder, you, you mentioned XPRIZE. So maybe, can you tell us a little bit about what they're doing in that space? Recognize you're gonna go in deeper a little bit more, but could you give us sort of like a highlight of what XPRIZE is doing in this space? What we're doing with the X Prize and the Pandemic Alliance in particular is realizing there's a thousand flowers blooming. We don't need a hundred different versions of, of printed ventilators or even a thousand versions of vaccines. We need to sort of collaborate and bring the best solutions forward and, and accelerate those. So one of our initiatives, initiatives I'll describe a bit more is a new rapid uh, COVID testing X Prize to accelerate tests that are fast, frequent, cheap, and easy, eventually that you could have at home, do for a dollar, do it every other day, that will help open up schools, society, uh, travel, et cetera. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. We'd also like to turn to another friend uh, known initially through Singularity University, uh, Eleanor Nell uh, Watson. Nell, I'd ask you the same. Could you real quick introduce yourself and what is giving you hope in terms of tech and data to help with COVID-19 and the recovery? Certainly. I specialize in machine learning and especially in machine ethics. So how we employ machine intelligence and emerging technologies, as well as perhaps how we can begin to teach those technologies what it means to be human and how to respect human values. I'm excited by these times. I recognize the great strides that we've made in recent, uh, recent months in this year itself. We have moved from a a physical world to a very digital world, and that is accelerating the development of new institutions. From this crisis, we're going to create a whole new set of institutions, much like we saw in the wake of the Second World War. I'm excited to see what comes of that, and I think that it's going to lead to a brighter future for all of us in the world today. Excellent, and, and I liked what you were saying, that it almost feels like you know, what were really months feel like years because we've accelerated a lot of trends that would have taken longer to happen. Uh, real quick, maybe if you could give us a preview, sort of like, are you seeing, you know, are you seeing early signs of new ways of working or new ways of collaboration that we can dive in deeper that, 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 that give you hope now? Absolutely. I think one of the greatest advances uh, recently is robotic avatars. <laughs> we mentioned uh, the X Prize before with, with Dr. Kraft. I'm also uh, one of the judges of the Avatar X Prize, and this is a, a prize for creating the best remote telepresence robots. And the contestants of that are absolutely astounding. And this combined with 5G technologies and AI enabled uh, compression technologies mean that we are very close to having uh, fully immersive experiences, but uh, through these remote uh, robotic avatars. Excellent. Well, that, that, I look forward to diving more into that. That's quite fascinating. I can imagine there's a lot of interesting applications. So we'd now like to welcome to the show Dr. Marcus Rani. Uh, you are also, uh, in addition to being many things, you are also one of the plank holders as a geotech fellow. Real quick, could you introduce the role that you do on a daily basis and what gives you hope when it comes to addressing the COVID-19 uh, recovery as well, please? 
Sure, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am originally a physician, trained in London, moved to India 10 years ago, and I work at the intersection between well-being and technology uh, and, and trying to sort of uh, focus on human performance through that process. Um, but what I have done over the last six months when the pandemic started to, to roll out, um, I went back as a volunteer and I've been working at the front lines uh, here in India uh, with the community work, which I'm sure I'll talk a little bit more about later on, uh, and um, happened to get COVID myself and had a, a, a long drawn out process through that as well. So lots of different insights to this disease, both in terms of treatment and experiences. Excellent. Well, one, I'm glad you're better. Um, maybe real quick, if you could share, maybe what are what are the things that in particular right now, and maybe we'll dive deeper later, are there one or two things that right now that you're seeing in India or seeing done globally uh, that are particularly promising for 2021 onwards? Yeah, we have this saying in India called Jugad, which is the celebrating the spirit of ingenuity. Hmm. And it's, it's problem solving using very limited resources, which is a which is a problem that we face a lot of here in this country. And what we've seen, and we can talk about more about that later on, is the is the way technology is really coming into all different spheres of innovation at the patient uh, side uh, within data collection units, using our field forces, etc. So lots of interesting Jugadi techniques from India coming out. Wow. Well, and I like the the phrase you have, Jugadi, because I'm thinking, you know, in the United States, we probably call that like a scrappy startup. But I think it's a it's a great ethos because innovation is born from necessity. And maybe that's what COVID-19 has done is it's created the conditions in which innovation needs to be born. Uh, I'd now like to turn back to Eleanor real quick. I think you have some slides. So if you don't mind pulling them up, we look forward to walking through and, and you narrating uh, sort of what's bringing you hope and what you're seeing in the world ahead. Uh, I know they're coming on the screen right now. Just give us a second. It's now full screen. Over to you, Eleanor. Awesome. Thank you very much indeed. We are starting to really understand just how important super spreaders are. We, we tend to think of the virus as, as being something that, you know, one person gives to two and then it increases. But really, we're learning just how important certain key individuals in certain activities are. We're starting to figure out that some people happen to have a very gregarious personality and they happen to do things that bring people together in close contact. We're learning that certain professions, such as lawyers, maybe have uh, 50 people use the same pen on a day to, to sign some documents. And that can be another super spreading um, technique or a super spreading uh, moment. We're also starting to learn just how important children are for super spreading as well. A study just came out uh, in looking at two Indian states and showed just how important children are um, with regard to spread, especially within families. Now, a lot of contact tracing is actually done through traditional manual methods. And there's a great deal of variation in the world. Different parts of the world um, have achieved a greater degree of efficiency in doing that. I think this is one of the reasons why there's a push towards digital forms of contact tracing using our smartphones, much more automated and hopefully a little more foolproof. Another thing is that sometimes um, certain uh, scandals have happened whereby manual contact tracing data has been accessed in ways which are a little bit um, potentially misusive. And having these digital layers can actually add extra layers of security for protecting our very private and sensitive information. I happen to have been part of an initiative to help with the ethics of contact tracing technologies and contact tracing apps to help the technologies as well as the organizations behind them to operate in ways that are a little bit safer. And I think this is uh, one of the biggest questions we've had this year is how to give more surety to people using these kinds of technologies. However, I think we can go further if we dare, because AI machine learning has remarkable capabilities for finding hidden correlations and things. Hmm. And those correlations can match up all kinds of other information. In our smartphones and other devices, we have these these MEMS, these microelectromechanical systems, tiny little devices that we use for 
um, for example, touch sensors, accelerometers, etc. But we can take this data and we can cross correlate it. We can merge these data sources together using machine learning in order to figure out all kinds of things about somebody's personality or their activities or um, their, perhaps their, even their, their state of mind. That kind of information could be very useful for understanding potential super spreader events. We also have wearables, which of course have heart rate and also increasingly pulse oximetry. This kind of information can potentially be mined to look for signatures, signatures which might indicate that someone is in a prodromal phase. That means that they are about to come down with an infection, but they don't necessarily feel bad yet. This kind of technology might even be able to work remotely. So there are now sophisticated algorithms which can look at video data from a standard video camera and act like a microscope for time to amplify tiny movements. And from that, we can generate a heart rate. And of course, potentially, we can look for signatures even through non-contact apparatus. However, again, there are many questions of the ethics and safety of doing this. Biometric data has in the past um, ended up places that it hasn't. And so, again, one of the greatest questions is not so much can we do this, but perhaps should we? And the ethical um, calculus of how far we go in protecting the world against the pandemic remains quite an open question. That's all from me. Thank you Excellent. so much. Thank you, Nell, for that. that. That's truly sort of setting a very provocative stage for which we should think about doing. And like you said, we have the technology. The question is, should we do it? Uh, and before I go real quick to Daniel to also sort of share his presentation and thoughts as well, one question I want to ask you is, are, when you've been looking at how to do things, and I saw you had on that chart, you had governance. Uh, are, are we looking for solutions that may be as simple as just, can we involve the public, whether it's through a citizen jury or, or some mechanism in which they are helping to make decisions. So this is not so much done to them as opposed to done more with them. And I'd be interested in your thoughts about that as well. Absolutely. I think this is one of the most important aspects of ensuring ethical accountability is to invite stakeholders who will be affected by decisions to participate in how those decisions are made. And I think the more that we can decentralize these decision-making mechanisms and involve more people, the um, less coercive those decisions are likely to be made and the more fair and happy and just uh, decisions are likely to come out of it. Excellent. Well, thank you, Nell. Uh, and, that, and, and I'm glad to see another uh, flag bearer. We've been pushing a lot for doing data trust. I think that's going to be something we need to do with COVID-19. So thank you for highlighting that. I'd now like to turn to Daniel. And maybe, if Daniel, if you can pull up what you have to share as well and, and walk us through it as well. That'd be interesting. Sure. Just before I share slides, I think a, a point both you and Nell are making, power of data, but also you know, a data donor. I think mm -hmm. the part of the future of public health, precision public health, will be that we're all hopefully data donors that we can build sort of the equivalent of a Google Maps or Waze for our public health. I mean, not just contact tracing, but of course the closest testing facility. What do I do based on my uh, age, culture, language, and to make that mobile and always updated and always uh, best, of, best of breed. So lots of opportunity there. I'm going to share just an, uh, a little element, I think, that is, is so critical uh, to we're talking about the future of, of, of testing. Um, is is obviously the 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 sine qua non is is tr test trace isolate, and one of the sort of major failures I think of of testing so of the challenge so far, particularly in the United States, has been our failure to have a uh, testing roll that as as quickly as possible. I mentioned in the intro that I'm chairing the X Prize Pandemic Alliance uh, Task Force, and one of the elements that the alliance has uh, initiated is a uh, to look at testing and specifics, uh, and we just launched in uh, August, a, a, new X, a new X Prize for frequent, fast, cheap, and easy testing. You can look more at xprize.org slash testing. But in, in, in summary, we, we did this in, to, in collaboration with Open COVID Screen, led by Jeff Huber, the founder of Grail. And the key sort of, I think we all know that given that testing is so critical, particularly identifying folks who might be super spreaders, as Nell mentioned, particularly when they're asymptomatic, um, is critical. And uh, the challenge to date is that a lot of the tests are expensive, have taken sometimes many days to a week to come back, still transmitted information through fax machines. Uh, they're not easy to do, require a healthcare professional, et cetera. So the goal of the XPRIZE Rapid COVID Testing Prize was 
to incentivize and accelerate and the crowd to develop tests that are frequent, meaning to really open up schools and workplaces, et cetera, uh, particularly for folks who are asymptomatic. Uh, you might need to do that every two days. Uh, uh, cheap, ID less, less than the cup of a cost of a cup of coffee in your country, so less than, let's say, five US dollars. Uh, fast, you have the results hopefully within an hour. And easy, meaning anyone can do it. You can even do it at home, uh, ideally connected to your smart device. So uh, that was sort of the idea of this. We uh, raised $10 million for 5 million base of this prize from several uh, organizations from uh, Anthem to, to, uh, to others. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, it's been quite successful. We had 707, te 707 teams from 70 countries uh, do the initial um, application. We're now down to the final 220 teams that are all receiving uh, test kits uh, to see how they do. We're testing the tests. The final 20 will come together um, and we'll be testing their actual tests on site. And then the final five will be accelerated into market in pilot test sites, uh, hopefully uh, by the end of this year to really help identify the best solutions and, and bring them to market. And there's a lot uh, uh, of tests uh, happening. Uh, uh, we can talk about the different forms from the classic PCR based, which are often swab and send to um, faster cheaper forms called LAMP to some sort of leveraging CRISPR to others that are sort of what we call our open category that might use the sound of your cough and your smartphone could diagnose a COVID related cough or breath sounds, or even speaking of breath, several groups are developing almost sort of uh, nano noses that can detect the molecules of COVID. So there's a lot of innovation happening. The trick is to identify the best um, that are fast, frequent, cheap, and easy and bring them to market. And then the follow on of this is the goal of the Pandemic Alliance is to address this pandemic, but hopefully uh, prevent uh, future ones, is that these sort of diagnostics that you can imagine in a few years, we'll all have a little, or within the year, a home-based diagnostic that connects to our smartphone that you know can not just do our, our blood sugar or cholesterol, but can be a home-based viral element for other sorts of infections, whether that's uh, the common flu or uh, the next generation of Ebola. So I think the platforms we're building now will help enable us in healthcare in the future. Um, you can learn more at uh, xprivacy.org, opencovidscreen.org. I'll mention one of the key pieces, once you've been tested and you're hopefully negative, or you've had COVID and have antibodies, or you've hopefully had the vaccine eventually and shown that you've had the vaccine, how do you prove that? Speaking of data, how do you think about digital passporting, like the digital yellow card? Uh, I'm involved with part of our uh, XPRIZE in initiative is open, co uh, open COVID screen and, sorry, the Commons uh, project, which just today uh, officially launched in collaboration with the World Economic Forum Common Pass, which will sort of be this digital yellow card. It's being piloted with several airlines for international travel. So imagine connecting your same day test uh, with your actual physical passport to help us get going. So lots of opportunity to accelerate uh, using data, new testing, if we're gonna sort of address this pandemic and, and future ones. So I'll stop there, thanks. Fascinating, and, and uh, I, it was interesting that you were sharing that, yeah, there's still, unfortunately, some public health labs that are communicating things by fax. Um, as, as I know, you visited me when I was at the FCC in 2014, they still had telephones in the lobby. Um, but even before that, uh, when I was with the Bioterrorism Preparedness Response Program and, and we dealt with the response to 9-11 and then the, the anthrax events and later SARS, there was an infusion of cash at the beginning of 2000, the 2000 period, that actually moved them off of uh, the fact that they actually had to not just do faxes, but they had to go to the library across the street to communicate test results when anthrax happened and then later when we were worried about SARS. There was funds for public health labs to move to computers, but like all things, when a, a future follow-on event didn't happen for more than five or six years, that money disappeared and now we're back to faxes, which is disappointing. I guess, Daniel, real quick before I go to Marcus, as a physician, uh, you know, wh how are you feeling about there's going to be more and more tests that will be done by the individual? Um, you know, how do you make sure that we continue to, to practice good medicine, make sure that we don't have hypochondriacs? I mean, what are you thinking about as a physician for that future? Well, I think number one, perfection is the enemy of good here in this right. setting. Oh, we need to have the gold standard, super high sensitivity and specificity test, but it takes several days or costs hundred dollars plus. We need potentially somewhat less accurate tests that you can do frequently, which will do a much better job at finding folks, particularly at their asymptomatic stage, uh, so that we can open schools safely, not have the super spreader events like we've seen even at the White House. Um, for the terms of the hypochondriacs, you know, we're still gonna get flu seasons coming. We're gonna have a, a, a com combined flu demic. Um, and so for the hypochondriacs, you want to know whether you just have the flu or you might have COVID. So it's actually going to hopefully lower stress and then hopefully better lead to public health where we can do, you know, smart test, trace and isolate. And so uh, information is power. We need to sort of unleash this. And again, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident within several months, we'll all have sort of the, not just the contact tracing app, but the diagnostic 
testing platform that's a, a dollar a day kit that will connect digitally through your phone and to a, a digital passporting uh, process as well. Fascinating, and I think this builds on what Nell was saying too about can we make it so it's more participatory that this is done with people as opposed to two people. Uh, so now Marcus, uh, recognizing that, that both uh, Nell and Daniel have set the scene, uh, what are you seeing in particular with Deeper Dives that's giving you hope and do you have thoughts about what was being shared uh, both in terms of what, what's going on with the data advances and the advances in using almost IO, Internet of Things technologies, IoT technologies for medical purposes? I, I think it's it's critical, in fact. I mean, if, if one just considers the unique challenge that we have in India, which is a country population of 1.3 billion, we currently have the second highest caseload, just shy of 7 million people, which will probably overtake the US in another week or so. But because of the economic pressures that we have, we are actually opening up faster than we even went into lockdown, even though our cases today were 68,000 new cases today alone. Uh, we, are, we have to open up because it's a lives versus livelihood debate which is playing out across the parliament, states and, and central government. So for us, uh, in order to not have a sledgehammer approach of a nationwide lockdown which we can no longer afford, we need to have these newer technologies at the edge, uh, at the field, to be able to consider really hyper-local situations of controlling the spread of the disease Plus, layered on top of that, we are still a country which faces significant vector-borne diseases, malaria, dengue, chikungunya. These are diseases which have a very similar clinical profile to the early symptoms that COVID has. And so for us, when we're going in the field, it's very difficult when someone comes up with a fever and maybe a cough and a body ache to know concretely whether this person needs to go down the COVID pathway or they need to go down on the BVD pathways, et cetera. So all of these testing uh, facilities are critical, therefore. The way I kind of think about it is a division between low-tech and high-tech. In the low-tech settings, we have mobile chest x-ray units, which we've been rolling out. We saw a lot of asymptomatic individuals with subclinical pneumonias and patches on the lungs. So we've got these trucks with inbuilt x-ray units, and we, you know, we use that as a screening tool. It has its problems with bulkiness, equipment, et cetera. We've got wearables that both Daniel and Eleanor spoke about. And we're particularly using that in the police forces uh, to get live data on, on some of those individuals. Mm. We have a, a force of a million mm. women, they're called ASHA workers. These are women who are part of the public health infrastructure that really go at the last mile. And we actually work with them uh, wherein they have a clipboard and a, and a paper and they actually do hand-based uh, surveys within the residential communities, which is then uploaded mm -hmm. into a cloud. So those are sort of the, the low-touch settings which we need to do because of the size of the population. Mm -hmm. But then we have the high-touch stuff, which is the innovation and the ingenuity that I spoke about. We have the app. In fact, the government app, which currently stands at 160 million downloads, officially has the record wow. for the fastest growing app in history. It overtook uh, 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 the Pokemon app. Um, we had, we had, uh, I've got the that app. makes me feel better. <laughs> we had close to 100 million downloads in 40 days. Um, so it was the fastest growing app in history. Uh, we have a technique of antibody pooling. So this is where we take five to ten patients we put all of their results in one ELISA kit if it's negative that means all are negative if it's positive then we then we test each one so that's a that's a way of saving costs and time we recently come out with a new crispr cas9 technique called faluda uh, which was named after an indian detective very similar to pro i imagine uh, and that's a very cheap test less than ten dollars uh, in comparison to some of the other tests that we have available and under an hour. Of course, we're also using some similar technology which Daniel mentioned around cough-based AI sensors and, and breath analyzers, et cetera. So it's a very interesting blend that we're having to put together because of the unique situation that we find ourselves here in the developing world. Excellent. Well, and, and if I could ask maybe a quick rejoinder to that, because we have a question that was asked from the, the audience, which is actually saying, are we finding that, that, that the race to expand testing, is that, is that exacerbating the divide between the tech sector and the government? Uh, and, and so maybe, Marcus, I'll go to you first for your perspective. What are you seeing in India? And, it, and, and if it is exacerbating, or even if it isn't, what do you think the tech sector needs most from government to sort of succeed? Does it need communication? Does it need money? Does it need trust to allow them to sort of see what they can do? Uh, what are you seeing between the relationships between government and the tech sector? And what is needed to make that relationship more, more beneficial for all? 
Yeah, I think at the beginning for us, we had a resource constraint, um, but obviously given the size of the situation and the scale of it, everyone pulled in, all stakeholders came in and, and were helping out. Right now, we currently have a thousand government approved labs and we have around 800 private labs in the country. So that number has significantly grown over the last six months. Uh, I, I think the biggest challenge we have is the trust issue, the trust in science, the trust in the test, the trust in the data, the, the, the gold standard, to use that term, is still the RT-PCR, which we know is associated with very many uh, collector-based uh, errors, uh, particularly when we do it out in the field. So there's lots of questions about the true validity of the test report, it going into the government center and then coming back to the consumer. So for us, it's closing that loop around trust, data centricity around that. Uh, and the, the second one would be around cost. Can we bring the cost low enough so that it's easily accessible, that there's no thinking twice and we can do it repeatedly rather than right now, which a person probably gets tested once and then they don't get tested again because they just don't have the financial means of doing so. Excellent. And, and, and so now I'm going to switch now to now and then to Daniel for your views, but let's frame it slightly differently because if what we're seeing is a world in which we are essentially instrumenting, giving people the ability to choose to both test themselves and instrument themselves, but possibly instrument their lifestyles, their homes. And, and also we could possibly instrument the world. I mean, we could actually be monitoring wastewater. Uh, we could be monitoring price signals. For example, when I was with the Bioterrorism Preparedness Response Program, we knew about SARS probably about five and a half months before China said anything. And the reason why was the price of garlic went up tenfold. Uh, and so could we monitor economic signals? Uh, we also know, for example, that um, with COVID-19, and this was the case with other outbreaks, you can also see from commercial satellite photos that patterns of life change from not going to factories and more people going to hospitals. And so that's also observable from space. So, so if we're going into a world in which we are now instrumenting people or giving the ability to choose to be instrumented in the planet, how do we make sure it doesn't become surveillance state? And as Mark had just said, how do we make sure it becomes trust? And so maybe now first you and then Daniel on your thoughts about this world we're going into. I think there are a couple of ways that we can improve that. One of which is definitely having better ethical rules. So that's standards and certifications for systems, for the organizations behind them, as well as pro professional credentials for the people who are working in these spaces too. There are also technological ways in which we can help to mitigate some of the risks. For example, we've seen the, the success of things like differential privacy. This is used by, for example, mapping applications. Whenever they tell you that uh, this section of road is really busy right now, and so they route you in a different direction, that's handled through differential privacy. So they use very complex algorithms to um, blend together people's data in ways that uh, reduces the risk of somebody being individually identified using very clever algorithmic means. And I think that these kinds of technologies are going to be instrumental in helping uh, people to avoid being accidentally identified, which unfortunately is uh, all too common, especially when you have lots of different data about a person from different directions. You can triangulate far more easily information about that person as well as who they are. So these technologies and good rules behind them, I think is some of the best ways that we can proceed from here forth. Excellent. Thank you, Nell. And Daniel, do you have additional thoughts too? Sure. So we live in this you know, exponential age. We're now in the internet of things, but the internet of medical things, the internet of the body, you can be streaming from your uh, Fitbit uh, all the way to uh, your genome, which you can now do on a device connected to your tablet. So the, the challenges, and those are very identifiable. You can even tell who's wearing a Fitbit or an Apple Watch based on their gait. So uh, you know, you might argue that privacy is somewhat dead. I think we need to be uh, not on the extremes. I mean, we can go too far uh, on the privacy elements. And while technologies like now mentioned, the blockchain can help, they're not, not gonna be a panacea. But when we realize that we are data donors and we all are building that Waze or Google Maps for health or public health that we all benefit, I think we'll be more willing, willing to be data donors. Um, Another element is related, you mentioned earlier, we talked about fax machines. We still have sometimes well-meeting laws like HIPAA, which is supposed mm -hmm. to also stand for not just privacy, but portability, that is required some uh, COVID tests to go through fax machines that has probably led to loss of life uh, that was preventable. Uh, we're now in the, one of the 
pluses of COVID, it's helped catalyze some changes in HIPAA. We can now do telemedicine and virtualized visits, which have exploded uh, several fold um, because HIPAA regulations were reduced. So you can do that through Skype or Zoom, et cetera. Uh, also how we do payment models for these things. So I think in general, we need to um, open people's minds to what's possible when they share data. Uh, I will also mention, uh, and, and Marcus mentioned this uh, to some degree, uh, we have the idea of social determinants and our big disparities, whether they're from India to across the US. And we know the disparities are also related to our, our digital access. So the digital uh, determinants of health matter. You know, my what first graders on Zoom on a high-speed internet, but many kids in the US and many parts of the world don't have access to basic internet connectivity that relates to education, which is important for health, as well as basic uh, personal and public health. Excellent. And, and I liked what you were saying, both one that HIPAA, given it was 1996, is probably due for an update 24 years in. So that will be interesting to see what that looks like. And then two, as you said, um, we need to recognize that, that, you know, the very fact that we can have a video conference, uh, this is kind of a luxury and we need to make sure that everybody has that capability. We should not uh, take it for granted. So I, I really appreciate that, Daniel. So I'm now going to pivot the panel a little bit uh, into a different perspective and go again first to Daniel, then to Marcus and to Nell. Let's talk about vaccine distribution strategies and, and what, what we could do to make it so it's done more with the public. Um, this is also a chance that if you have any thoughts about the infodemic, uh, we already know there's massive misinformation surrounding COVID-19. I can only imagine it's going to get even worse once there are actually vaccines. Are there side effects or not? How serious they are or not? Is there separate vaccines for separate people? So, so maybe Daniel, recognizing I just threw you the first hot potato and then we're going to go to Marcus and then to Nell. How would you, if you could be a, a benevolent, a benevolent uh, individual for the day, what would you sort of suggest to leaders in, in the public sector and in the private sector to have a more optimal vaccine distribution strategy? You know, part of that is addressing the educational piece. We are in this uh, infodemic and even the anti-vax movement was strong with, you know, trying to suppress well-worn uh, vaccines like measles, which have now roared back. And I'm a pediatrician. And I know it's really important to educate parents on that realm. Um, so part of it is education. Uh, no vaccine is going to be 100% efficacious or have zero side effects. And part of uh, the sort of crowdsourced future is that we're all going to be able to um, track that we've been vaccinated, our app might remind us to get the booster, it might enable us to report back if we're having you know, symptoms beyond a sore throat and a low, low grade fever, which even happens with the common flu shot, which everybody should go out and get, by the way, it's flu season and you don't want to get uh, one or either. Uh, and when we do eventually have one of multiple COVID vaccines, they may work differently for older folks or folks who have immunosuppression or different ages, where there's a lot to learn. Uh, there won't be one size fits all vaccine. And I think on the benevolent side, we should hopefully identify the folks who might want to be getting it first, whether those are frontline workers or older folks or those with comorbidities and figure out a, a hopefully equitable, uh, logical way to do it. There are always going to be people who fight to get to the front of the line. Uh, we have some folks in power who've been getting therapies that uh, are still on, uh, not even, even at a clinical trial. So we need to think about health equity, um, but also realize that this won't be perfect. Uh, uh, if the vaccine is only effective for 60% of folks, which it might be, you still need a good percentage of the population to get vaccinated, we're going to have that herd immunity stimulated by the vaccine. So lots to unpack, but uh, part of its education, part of its leveraging digital, the digital passport I mentioned earlier might be part of that as well. Excellent. And, and I like to let you emphasize that, yes, it's definitely about education. And also we should remind people, uh, please get your flu shot. Um, that, that's something we can all do and it'll actually play a big role. So, so with that, uh, Marcus, your perspective uh, also as a physician and what, are you, what would you do if you could be a benevolent leader for the day to recommend a more uh, benevolent uh, vaccine distribution strategy for the world? I, I would echo a lot of uh, comments that Daniel just made. Um, uh, Dr. Swami, Asoma Swaminathan uh, had a session last week and she spoke about the role of science now in, in rebuilding trust in society. And it sort of cuts through to the conversations we've already had about the infodemic and anti-vax movements, et cetera. I think uh, for us, um, the equitable distribution is a very important uh, piece uh, in, in this part of the world, developing world and going across as well. The pseudo sort of coming back to space, I suppose the pseudo space race, which is now playing out through various sort of nationalistic uh, programs around developing a vaccine is fantastic in propelling the science. Uh, but around that, there is still a, a, a sense of weariness and caution around the efficacy, the safety standards, uh, and the processes which are being employed uh, to claim to be the first one and, 
and have it being injected into the military forces or, or certain sets of the population. So I think that's a very important piece uh, around that distribution. Um, Antibody-led uh, immunity, passports, etc. Given that we are going to see a situation where in the first year or two there are going to be a limited number of vials available and we want to get them to the people who need it most, maybe there's a play to utilize the, the big data uh, to identify people who do have current levels of neutralizing antibodies and perhaps remove them from the cohorts within those so that the rest of them can actually receive the vaccine so that we're being a little clever and smart with how we distribute this limited resource. Uh, and lastly, again, I'll mention that ASHA workforce that we have in India, you know, utilizing the power of the last mile uh, with regard to distribution. There's, there's clearly going to have to be a cold chain led uh, strategy for ensuring that we get this out. But even though we get the vaccine to the village, who's actually going to administer that? Uh, and a random comment, actually something randomly that came up on my Twitter feed last week was an article that I saw on the Weather Channel was that they were actually talking about the number of marine sharks that are going to be required because it is their liver which acts as an adjuvant for the, uh, for the, for the vaccine. And 500,000 marine sharks are going to be uh, slaughtered in order to get the, enough liver uh, sample required for this. So there's some very interesting things around this movement uh, that, uh, that science uh, has, a, has an important role to play. Fascinating series of dimensions. And, and, I, and I think it is, like you said, we need to recognize that, that we may have a responsibility to, 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 the, to the lives that are able to help uh, make the vaccine possible uh, as animal lives. Uh, also, one thing that, that actually, and, and, and if this is too sensitive, there was a question that was asked by the audience in terms of should, should children be the priority or not? And I know, at least from my own experiences when I was in the bioterrorism program, sometimes the challenge is, is with children, you know, the last thing you want is for them to get side effects. And so I don't know, Marcus, if you have any particular thoughts about, you know, as we roll this out, is it better to initially do adults and then see how it goes and then do children? Uh, the, the person that was asking the question was, should we try to vaccinate them earlier so they can get back to school? I don't know if you as a physician have any, uh, have any viewpoints on that, Marcus, in terms of the trade-offs there. So, so as a young parent, I've got, I've got two toddlers, a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and I can tell you how difficult it is, as I'm sure, you know, I know you have uh, the young ones as well, David, and, and many others watching. It's very difficult to manage children at home, and, and a lot of us want our children to go back out because it's impacting their mental, emotional uh, well-being and learning and development needs. Um, I won't pretend to be an expert on the science around the efficacy and the risk profile with children, but what I have seen, at least clinically, is that the, the, the severity of the symptoms uh, seems to be significantly lower versus the older populations. Um, and whilst they're still carriers, they don't seemingly suppose, uh, suffer as severely. Uh, so, you know, if, if there was a limited set, the, 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 the current thinking would be frontline workers, doctors, healthcare workers, etc., and then the vulnerable and the elderly, and then move on from there. But I, I, will, I will put my hands up and be guided by the global experts around this. Well, thank you. That was, I think, very well said. And, and like you said, we're all, we're all making sense of this space. And thank you very much for the, that insight, Marcus. So now I'm going to ask you the same question with a slightly different spin. Um, both what would you do for have a more benevolent uh, vaccine distribution strategy? We've also had a question from the audience that asked the question, could possibly XPRIZE do a contest on anonymization? In other words, you know, if we're going into a world in which we want to be able to have these precision devices, these precision data strategies, but at the same time, we want to have anonymization done on hardware, software, procedures. Interested in your thoughts as someone who obviously does a lot with data and AI now on both what would a benevolent vaccine distribution strategy look like? And is there a role for increased competitions to make sure we can have anonymization for everybody? I would recommend a soft sell and all carrot, no stick. I think people need to feel that they have bought in to a decision to take the, the vaccine and to accept it and that they haven't been frog marched into anything that they didn't want to, to be involved in. I think that's, that's really important. I think there are some uh, legitimate questions people have. For example, a lot of vaccine research is done on very healthy adults. And, you know, is it fair to then transpose those results onto older populations, you know, uh, as well as, of course, children? I think that perhaps people could 
um, look at the research which shows that all cause mortality tends to reduce in those who've been vaccinated. Um, so it, it seems as if people that, that receive vaccines are more protected against all kinds of other infections as well as uh, sequelae, so follow on effects to infections such as MS and Parkinson's, etc. Hmm. So if we can make a case that actually getting this vaccine might uh, reduce somebody's uh, danger of suffering those kinds of diseases in future, or indeed it might even reduce uh, somebody's chance of catching a common cold, hmm. then I think that might be uh, one potential uh, pull factor that could bring people towards vaccines. Excellent. And so now I'm going to follow uh, up. Yeah, let's go. On the an uh, anonymization side, I think that's a fantastic idea. And I would love to see a prize in that area. I think this is uh, one of the areas in the world today where research is particularly crucial. Excellent. And, and so I'm going to build on that because we've got about um, eight minutes left before we go to the lightning round. And what we've really been talking about is a lot of interesting advances in data and technology, making sure we can involve the public. But the question is, who governs this? And, and I know the old model for the 20th century is governments, whether at the local level, state or federal level, national level. But are we in a world in which now some very large tech companies, as well as maybe some, some other, um, either their sovereign wealth funds or things like that, may have outsized influence in this space? And so maybe I'm going to go first to you, now to build on that idea of, of could we have a, a, a push or a competition to see who could develop strategies for anonymizing almost universally software or hardware efforts in this space? Could we then actually make another push and say, are there ways, whether it's through data trust or other ways involving the public so that it's not a top-down governance approach? But like you said, we don't want to frog march anybody towards this. It's much more done at the local level. So I'd be interested in your thoughts. How can we govern this better uh, with people as we roll forward with these strategies? Well, I think that blockchain built on you know Bitcoin technology is a fantastic example of what one ingenious hacker uh, can, can bring to the world. You know, uh, various positives and some negatives have, have come from that invention, but uh, it's, it's a doozy of an invention for uh, increasing accountability in society. And I think that that illustrates that there's lots of room for very bright people to come up with similar ingenious solutions when it comes to anon uh, anonymization or anonymity. And we have technologies such as uh, zero-knowledge proofs and homomorphic encryption, which are very promising, um, but still they're mostly experimental and they're not quite ready for prime time. So I think a little bit of a, a, a spurt forward for those kinds of technologies would be just a ticket for our world today. Excellent, thank you. I'm now gonna to go to Marcus and then to Daniel. So Marcus, if you were looking at this and you were thinking about how we could govern this better, uh, whether it's through technology or through more people-centered approaches, what would be your recommendation about how we could govern this better, given the fact that a lot of this is gonna be done by the private sector, but it obviously is impacting communities and communities need to be involved? I, I won't pretend to be uh, an expert in this uh, in this space, David, but what I will say is that I'm a big believer in the power of storytelling, and, and Nell sort of touched upon that uh, in her last answer. And I think the, the, the narrative that we need to have to engage people in this conversation needs to be rethought of and redone. Uh, when the COVID pandemic began, uh, it was almost a very autocratic, uh, centralized approach going into lockdown, the largest psychological experiment ever conducted across the world, you know, two thirds of people living uh, in their houses. Uh, and people have understandably has now started to build COVID fatigue or whatever it is the newest term is for that. Uh, against these uh, against these pressures. So uh, I think for all of us, irrespective of the sphere, whether it's the private sector, government, technology, science, physicians, etc., we need to re-engage people uh, through uh, honest data, science-led data, uh, and, and actions to then that then back that up. Excellent. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, so Daniel, your thoughts about um, how do we govern this? How do we do deal with the world that has increasingly requirements of working across different sectors and then across different nations and communities? I think first we need to lead as governments with smart science and public policy and public health, which has been uh, lacking in several governments. Uh, even uh, in the United States, we have lots of variance between state to state and governors are 
uh, some are opening up early and some are uh, fostering better policies uh, and smarter openings. So I think uh, some harmonization might be useful, including at the global level. Now that this is you know a pandemic, we're realizing we're more interconnected than ever. We can you know can be anywhere in the world in less than 24 hours uh, on plane, and that has spread this pandemic as well. Uh, I'm I'm wondering. Uh, Marcus was mentioning sort of the community health nurses and others that go out there. Maybe part of this future of, of global policy might be a, a global sort of public health corps, where just like we have volunteer ambulance drivers and firemen in some communities, you could be a volunteer public health worker, get trained up, leveraging technology to be a contact tracer, also uh, addressing social disparities in your community, uh, and kind of you know have that sort of top of mind build to that. Uh, better infrastructure and and global policy levels, and and also sharing our data in new ways, um, whether it's federated data that keeps it anonymous, or uh, you mentioned the garlic elements. I think it was a, a company called Blue Dot, started by an epidemiologist physician in Canada, that was first to pick up the digital breadcrumbs of, in Wuhan. And the earlier we can do that, the more proactive we can be. Just like healthcare in general is sick care, we uh, have intermittent data and we are reactive and wait for the heart attack, stroke, or pandemic. I think uh, in terms of public health, we can also be much more uh, proactive using continuous data and to bring that kind of information anytime, anywhere at lower cost with, with better outcome. But that takes leadership, being led by science and uh, smart policy. Excellent. And, and since we have a little bit more time left before we go to the lightning round, um, the, the immune system for the planet idea. We've actually, with the Atlantic Council, there was an article that our CEO, Fred Kemp, uh, published with CNBC. Uh, we actually have had some private roundtables and, and it does look like this is fairly a nonpartisan idea in the United States that sometime in 2021, there will be funds put towards better instrumenting detection of future pandemics. And hopefully this is not just a US effort, that we really embrace it stronger together with allies. We work with India, we work with Europe, we work around the world with our, our colleagues. So if we're talking about something that's done this way, uh, and it really is a network of, of data collection, um, what further is from passive sensors. Uh, we also had a question that was raised that we didn't get to that the reality is, you know, hotels, restaurants may have a lot of data that might also be useful. So if we're going into this, uh, who would you have on the cast of characters of a pandemic prevention board that was looking at these different collections of data and sensors? And I'm gonna go first to Daniel, then to Marcus, and then to Nell. Real quick, you know, give us maybe one, one minute. Who would you have as a cast of characters for a pandemic prevention board if this was truly a global effort to detect future pandemics faster and respond to them faster as well? Well, it's, it's fascinating to look at, you know, purchase data, whether it's, uh, you know, Tylenol or garlic, but uh, healthcare data is still the, the oil. Uh, and we've had challenges in the United States with what's called interoperability, the electronic medical records from Epic and Cerner, all scripts often don't talk to each other. And one of the positive things starting a year or so ago is we've got the Microsofts and Apples and Cerner's and the big healthcare system starting to come together and collaborate on how can you look at uh, patient data in new ways, which could be much even more instructive on uh, not just is there something going on, but Who's responding? How do we leverage not just a, a global immune system, but a global learning system to accelerate what's learned in the intensive care unit to how you manage someone as an outpatient? And, and one of the things I think that's being catalyzed with COVID is, is faster learning. Uh, there's often that 17 year gap from data to knowledge to point of care, you know, standard of care. And sometimes we can accelerate that. So we need folks to get out of their competitive buckets and, and collaborate. And that, that requires you know, the big tech players, uh, from Amazons and Apples and, and, and Facebooks to healthcare systems to the public health authorities and global health authorities, and, and maybe you know tidying that together with WHO, et cetera. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, so Marcus, recognizing again, not asking you to necessarily be an expert in terms of the geopolitics that are going on between say the United States and Europe or China, who though would you have on this board if this was truly a global effort, who would you include on the pandemic prevention board for an immune system for the planet? Yeah, it's a very important question. I remember reading the article that you had published on the geotech site, uh, and I recently followed that up with a, a piece myself. And, and in that research that I did, which was really looking at the intersection between the climate crisis and, and planetary health, uh, some, some of the interesting changes that we're seeing, which would be good to include those aspects of science in there as well, would be climate scientists, would be maybe veterinary sciences, et cetera. Uh, because at least looking at the last eight to 10 sort of pandemics or regional epidemics, a lot of them started in sort of food markets, uh, places where there was man nature conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be an important piece. And the other of course is, is, the, is the new pathogens which might get released into the uh, biosphere as we see glacier melting, as we see climate changes around the world, things that we haven't been exposed to for uh, 
for any of our uh, evolution as far as our species are concerned. So I would, I would add a, a very broad uh, set of scientists in, in that panel as well. Excellent. And, and, I, and I really particularly like what you highlighted there, Marcus, which is while we may build this to detect future pandemics, why not also build it to recognize, let's do other shocks that we're worried about in terms of climate change or what, and making sure that there's actually potable water that's available around the planet and that there is food and things like that. So maybe this is really, we think of this as like the resiliency network for the planet and that in some respects, maybe COVID-19 is, is a dress rehearsal for other stresses we may face in the decade ahead. Uh, so now your thoughts before we go to lightning round about who would you include on, on a board such as this? I think, I think you make a wonderful point thinking about, um, for example, environmental damage being done by some bad actor. I, when you, when you mentioned, you know, people working in hotels, you know, and how useful that kind of information could be, it made me think of uh, Tiffin Wallas in, in India, you know, hoarding lots of people's lunches around, you know, visiting dozens of people in a day or uh, those sort of babushka ladies who, who sell tea, but who see everything. And I think it would be very worthwhile if we could tap into that kind of human intelligence network so that if people see something, they, they say something, they, they snap it with their phone, uh, they, they get some small token or reward for that. And perhaps then if there is some outcome from that, they also get a share of of some some redress uh, that that may come from that. I think that kind of um, network of of awareness is something which can lead to a more self aware society or even a self aware planet. And I think those are the kinds of decentralized or distributed institutions on a global scale that I would really like to see come from uh, this kind of crisis. Excellent. And, and, and I think uh, one thing that I think for our audience to share is, is also we're assuming that part of what was done with the initial proposal for the immune system of the planet is it's is intentionally about diverse representation. So we would have communities. This would not just be the current dominant players on the world stage, which unfortunately are less than diverse and it's less than just, but that it would include diverse representation and would really be at the community level. So we make sure those groups that may in the past have been marginalized have a voice and this is done with them and they're actually able to guide things forward. Um, so now we're at the lightning round. We've got about seven minutes left. Uh, I'm going to go first to Marcus, then to Nell, and then Daniel, you, you'll, you'll have the final word. Two to three tweet length recommendations, whether it's for public sector leaders, private sector leaders, or just generally things we should be mindful of as we move forward with improving, using data and tech to improve the response to the COVID-19 recovery. Uh, Marcus, first, what are two or three tweet length recommendations that you would make? All right, um, slightly philosophical perhaps, but uh, suffering is, is, uh, is common. It's how we respond to the challenges which is entirely our decision. And this, I think, is, a, is one of those moments in, our, in, in, in mankind that, that's our choice to respond in a particular way. I think that's one aspect. The second would be um, and let science lead, uh, let the data, let the science lead this. Um, oftentimes, I remind people that you know, we, we've only known about this disease for about eight or nine months. Uh, HIV has been around for 45, 50 years. A TB for about 300 years and malaria for a couple of thousand years and we still haven't figured out how to solve those so 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 patience but let the science lead and let that uh, let decisions come from from those excellent really like both what you said in particular I think we could try and get let science lead trending that would be great because uh, I think that is definitely a way forward and I really appreciate your insights Marcus on that topic uh, now your two to three recommendations that the world could do there's no shortage of untapped potential in the world of AI and emerging technologies when it comes to managing the pandemic, as well as some of the other effects that we've experienced, such as logistics and um, food not getting from farms to markets, etc. There's a lot of room for greater optimization. However, there's a lot of room for the misuse of these kinds of technologies too. We really must pay very strong attention to how to do these things ethically in ways that are fair, that are accountable and transparent, and that involve all stakeholders affected. Only by uniting ethics with technology can we truly benefit from it. 
really appreciate those marks, particularly emphasizing the ethics. Um, I will recommend to our audience to build on what Nell just said. We have done articles talking about avoiding uh, the weaponization of data and recognizing in the past that has been done against marginalized groups, and also calling out the fact that in the past, and even in the, even in the current present, there are instances where tech is either unconsciously or heaven forbid consciously racist, that's something that we need to be mindful of. And maybe we could use this COVID-19 response to address some of those inequities that need to be addressed. And so now, thank you for elevating that we need to be both mindful and intentional in the ethics that we do as we go forward. Uh, Daniel, your closing thoughts, bring it home for us, please. Well, I love your background. That's the, it's the blue planet we all live on. Um, it reminds me of a, of a, I guess, a quote from uh, Regina Dugan, the former head of DARPA, that you know, um, Sputniks uh, catalyzed the space age, and and uh, COVID may be uh, sort of catalyzing the the health age, and that we can use this crisis and opportunity of of uh, uh, to spur new innovation, new collaborations, whether it's data based or public health based, or or you know, from new platforms for mental health to vaccinations to therapy. So a lot of hopefully good can come out of this that will uh, recognize that this is our practice pandemic and can prevent future ones and even address uh, global global warming and beyond. So opportunities amongst the crisis. And uh, I guess the other short one would stay, stick with the basics, um, get vaccinated for the flu, still wear your mask, uh, don't get complacent. Uh, and we need to do the basic blocking and tackling elements uh, integrated with smart technology to, to enable everybody uh, to have equity in terms of accessing everything from N95 masks to, to testing and vaccines, um, but um, start with the basics and, and, and that this is a, a community and global effort. We all need to, to, to play a role in, in, in the solutions. Excellent. And I liked what you said, which is, you know, there is opportunity in crisis. Uh, make sure we, we stick with the basics and make sure we also are mindful of equity. Also, Daniel, I don't know if you know, it was six degrees of separation. In a past life, when I was very young, when I was 17, I got to work at the Institute for Defense Analyses with Dr. Bill Jeffrey, who is now the CEO of SRI. Regina Dugan was also at IDA. So you, you've actually managed to do, do I guess, the, the uh, six degrees of separation for the geotech hour. Thanks for, uh, for the, the, we'll start this as a future uh, effort that we move forward on. But also want to thank our panelists. This has been a very robust discussion. I, I have found it very insightful about how we think about how we address tests, treatment, and vaccine distribution strategies and do so in a global perspective. It is also about empowering the public to be more participatory. And I look forward to additional conversations because clearly this is going to be a long haul. We're in it together. And I want to thank Nell, I want to thank Marcus, and I want to thank Daniel for everything that each of you do as positive change agents and for joining us in the Geotech Hour. Onwards and upwards together. <laughs>